Formula One on Five Live. Well, qualifying for the Hungarian Grand Prix went on a little longer than we all expected it to. But despite the rain delays and a couple of big shunts, we got there in the end. And not for the first time since I was doing my GCSEs and Mark Priestley was shadowing Jenny Gao in the pit lane, McLaren are one and two in qualifying. Wow, 2012. Is that how long it's been? A, I mean, over a decade. Unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, you're right. I was. I was shadow, <laughs> shadowing Jenny Gow back then. Um, yeah, amazing stuff. But do you know what? It's been... Uh, you know, a decade of hard work in the background that's brought them there. They've gone through some really tough times. Everybody within that team has felt the pain and the suffering. Having gone through a period of real success, they went through this huge, long spell that was drawn out where they were actually the worst team at some points in that. But all the way through, building things and pieces in the background, getting the structure right, the personnel right, building the infrastructure, and now they're seeing results. And days like today will give everyone a massive boost. It really will. Well, you know what? Let, let's hear straight away from Lando Norris, your pole man for the Hungarian Grand Prix. Hey, Lando, that was a heck of a lap, and you got it done when you needed to do it under pressure. You must be delighted. Yeah. Um, yeah, a good lap, especially... Uh because I only had one set, everyone else had two, so it was definitely a little bit more pressure to, to deliver first time out. Um, uh, yeah, so it makes it a little bit sweeter. We did it in a more, more difficult way. Um, but uh, yeah, pole for, for anyone is, is always a nice thing and a good feeling, and uh, then to have a one-two is even better. So a good day for us. The pace, obviously, relative to Red Bull looks strong. I know the race is a different kettle of fish altogether, but you must be confident about your chances tomorrow, especially with the lockout for the for, for McLaren. Yeah, I mean, confident. I think we've been feeling good all weekend as a team. Um, but Red Bull are the same. I wouldn't say they're any slower than us. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe maybe you could put us potentially a little bit quicker today. If I had another set of tyres, I feel like I could have definitely got another tenth or two out of it. Um, but... Uh, it's 400s behind. You can't, you can't just say we're quicker because we are on pole and uh, that's it, you know. So uh, he's 400s behind. He had a, even Perez. Perez had the best race pace yesterday. Max second best race pace. So, yeah, um, they'll still be challenging us a lot tomorrow. Good luck. Norris taking his second part of the season, third in his career. He'll start alongside his teammate, Oscar Piastri. There's been nothing between them so far in this qualifying session. So close. But of course, they'll have the best year in the house for the race. Are they going to be allowed to race? Is this game on down to turn one? Well, it has to be, doesn't it? I mean, it, first of all, it's a great result for Oscar Piastri as well as it is for Lando Norris because Piastri has been lost a little bit in recent times when all the talk has been around Lando. Of course, he got that great win. He's in this battle now with Max Verstappen. So there's been a lot of focus on Lando Norris and, and Piastri has been lost in that to some extent. He doesn't want to find his career disappointed peering down a path where he finds himself as almost a second driver. And so days like today when there was nothing in it, I mean, it was two hundredths of a second that put him second on the grid. He will want to show that he's quick enough, that he, he's capable of beating Norris. So heading down into turn one, I, and I hope he does get his elbows out and I hope they are allowed to fight. They will be allowed to fight in the early part of the race. Yes, the team might have to make some sensible decisions later on, depending on how it plays out. But either of those drivers should be going into the opening laps of this Grand Prix, believing they can get in front and win. Well, five of the last 12 Grand Prix here have been won from pole. Seven of the last 12 have been won from the front row. So statistically, it's looking rosy for either Norris or Piastri. Uh, let's hear it from the man who qualified in second, Oscar Piastri. Hey, Oscar, I imagine it's a bit of a case of mixed emotions because obviously great to get a, a 1-2 for the team, but 0.022 is nothing, is it really? <laughs> yeah, um, of course, very happy for the team and, and obviously a, a good result to be starting on the front row, but when it's so so close, uh, regardless of who it is, you always uh, can't help but be a little bit frustrated. So, uh, no, a, a good day, on, on, honestly. Um, yeah, yesterday afternoon was, was pretty tricky for us, so... It's nice to, to bounce back a little bit today and, uh, and yeah, have a, have a good result. It feels like you're absolutely on it and you mentioned that difficulty they had yesterday. How much confidence do you take into tomorrow and can you fight for the win? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think it's a, a very long run down to Turn 1. Uh, you know, it's a tight Turn 1. Uh, we've seen a lot of action there in, in the past and, um, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll see what, what happens, but I think we've got a, a quick car underneath us. The weather's going to be very different tomorrow by the looks of things, so we'll see how that 
pans out for everybody, but um, no, I think there's a, a good chance. Best luck, Oscar. Thank you. Now, another little stat for you in perhaps Piastri's favour. The last time McLaren had that front row lockout in 2012, the driver in second was Jensen Button, won the race. But listening to Piastri, certainly his, his Park Ferme interview straight after qualifying, and also just generally the way it's been so far for Piastri this season, which I think it's fair to say has been a little underwhelming, certainly at the start, given all the prowess that was behind Piastri when, when he came into Formula One last year. Has he got it in him to to get his elbows out and to fight for his first Grand Prix win? Well, we're about to find out. But what I thought you were about to say there was when they last had that front row lockout, Oscar Piastri was about six. Oh, we probably, well, <laughs> uh, 2012. Yeah, probably. <laughs> um, but no, look, he needs to show a bit more aggression. Uh, you know, I, I actually believe that... Um, Piastri needs to get his elbows out. He needs to show the fight because actually, even in these post-session interviews, in the in the run-up to the race, some of the words that you you use in terms of when you're speaking to the media can start to have an impact. You see the more experienced drivers do this all the time when they use the media to their advantage to either put pressure on an opponent, just to strike fear into an opponent, just to set up what they might be going to do. I want to hear Piastri saying, yeah, I'm going to try and win this race. You know, I believe I can get to turn one first. And yes, we're teammates. And yes, we'll show each other respect. But there is no way I'm sitting back and settling for second. This is my race to win. And, and that's what I want to see from him. It's kind of what he needs to do because... It's not just about this weekend and this particular Grand Prix. It's about his career and his stature within the team, his status. That's important for a racing driver. He would have been 11 years old. <laughs> well, I wasn't far not off. Not far off. <laughs> not far off the Astri. Uh, uh, the other thing, though, weighing on not just Norris and Piastri's shoulders going into this race, but also on McLaren's shoulders, off the back of uh, a strategy error that actually cost them a 1-2 victory, most likely, in Silverstone. Piastri left out a little bit too long. The tire choice for Norris in the, in the final section of, of the Grand Prix and a couple of other mistakes. Canada that comes to mind as well. How much are they going to be thinking we cannot make a mistake? And actually, is all that thinking going to lead to more mistakes? Yeah, that, that's the problem, isn't it? When, you, when you're so terrified of making a mistake, you're far more likely to make a mistake quite often. Or your hesitation in thinking that means you don't make the right decision. You could argue, perhaps, and I'm sure if they reflect on it, which they would have done by now, that, that decision in Canada, yes, it was a split-second decision. When the safety car came out, they had time to bring Norris into the pits uh, and get himself onto the right tyres, and that may well have changed the outcome. He may well have won that Grand Prix. He certainly we would have been in with a shout with it. You can look at other races over this last few, this run of last few, where decisions that they've made have just with hindsight at least have fallen the wrong way and quite often it's the teams that are fighting their way back to the front that don't yet have the confidence of a, a serial winner which you could say is definitely the case with the likes of Red Bull Verstappen you don't have the confidence to make the split seconds decisions instantly and trust your gut you know you're always questioning even if only in the back of your mind you're questioning am I making the right decision could this be embarrassing could I get it wrong could it cost you know what could be a big result so Going into the race this weekend with a front row lockout, they've done everything right so far. The car's working well. Both drivers are working well. Now they just need to believe that the reason they're in this position is because they're good enough. They're on the front row because they're good enough. They need to start thinking more like winners. And I'm not criticizing in saying this. This is the natural process of becoming winners again, having been through a long period of not being winners. They've got people like Andrea Stella as the team principal who is magnificent and he, he is used to winning. Yep. So when you've got somebody at the helm like that, surely that mindset trickles down and they shouldn't be scrambling because, oh, they're not used to winning. And it is trickling down, but there's a thousand people in that team. And, you know, I can tell you because I was very fortunate to spend 10 years at McLaren through really successful times where we won championships and, and races every week. You know, everybody believes they're good enough in that phase. You know, none of us believed we shouldn't be at the front if we went away from a race weekend when we weren't at least in contention for a race win. It's massively disappointing. Most people, most of the thousand people at McLaren now have never been in that situation. They've never won a championship. They might have won one or two races for, for most of them. 
that changes the entire environment. It takes time to build it back. Yes, Andreas Teller's doing a wonderful job. I've got nothing but respect for what he's done and what he's doing. And his mindset, you know, his belief will be trickling down. It takes time. You need the good results to come regularly for you to build that throughout the organization so that when it comes to those big split-second decisions like they had in Canada, they just commit and get it right. Well, McLaren chasing what could be their 12th win around the Hungaroring. Uh, so one of the most successful teams here. But of course, that all came uh, years ago. So not in in this modern era. Um, one and two for McLaren. Just behind them is Max Verstappen in the Red Bull. And when we first saw him out of the car with those two minutes remaining after after the red flag and there was going to be a restart, we're all thinking, oh, no, what what is this? What's going on? What, I can't believe he's doing this. But now when you actually think about it and take stock, you just go... Yeah, fair. He called it perfectly. This is why he's Max Verstappen. He's actually quite cool, calm and collected what he needs to be. And he doesn't need to... He knows when he's hit the limit and there's nothing else in the tank. And that's what that was. I suspect you're right. You know, yes, he, he was frustrated as he crossed the line, but he immediately maybe knew that he'd given it everything and yet McLaren were quicker. And that's genuine. You know, they, they have been quicker than the Red Bull all weekend so far. Not by much, but just enough and you know if you're Max Verstappen and you've left nothing out on the table you can't beat the the the, um, the McLarens in front of you and then it just starts to very lightly rain you've got no more new new sets of tyres left with two minutes left on the clock maybe he just knows there is nothing more he's got to give but he is calm and collected and that will mean that when we come to the race he won't be worried that he's sitting on the second row he's done it from there before he's got a car particularly with a very powerful drs and and at this particular circuit two drs zones with only one detection point you can be really quite strategic coming out of the last couple of corners about how you use drs because the effect of having it lasts for pretty much the entire first sector of the lap the the drs um uh, tool or the DRS uh, power on that Red Bull car is really quite effective and quite strong, particularly on high downforce settings that they've got this weekend there. So I don't think he'll be necessarily too worried that he's sitting in third right now behind two McLarens. The one thing that will potentially concern him when it comes to race day is the McLaren has t- traditionally so far this season in the last few rounds been very, very good at looking after its tyres, isn't it? It certainly has. The other thing as well is that pole position is on the left-hand side. That's the racing line. Piastri will have the dirtier side in second. Verstappen will again be on the cleaner side. So depending on the star, he could well pick off one already down to turn one. Yeah, and you know we've been talking about Lando Norris's starts in recent times. It's not that he's a bad starter. I certainly don't want to give that impression. But at least on one occasion, maybe two, his starts have not necessarily been as good as Verstappen. We saw him lose out to George Russell in recent times as well. You know, it's not something that he needs to be worried about, but it'll be from Verstappen's point of view, something he'll want to capitalise on on getting ahead of him. Well, Verstappen then starts the Hungarian Grand Prix from third. Let's hear what he had to say. Hey, Max. uh, I know that generally when you get to qualify, you tend to find something extra. Did you manage to find that today? And was that just a case of it wasn't quite enough for Paul? I mean, I, I think golfing itself went quite smooth, but uh, yeah, just not quick enough. I mean, the gap looks small, but I also got two laps in with two sets of tyres, where Lando, of course, only had one. Um, so I don't think it, it is a realistic gap also, um, if you would have had a, a, another set of tyres. Um, so yeah, it's just a bit of a shame, a little bit frustrated, of course, after yeah, all the updates on the car as well, you know, I was hoping for a little bit more, but uh, at the moment, yeah, we still need to try and improve it further. Do you think you can take the fight to the McLarens tomorrow? And do you think it's just a case with the update of just need a couple more race weekends to understand it more? Uh, I would hope so, but I don't know at the moment. I mean, uh, they've been, for my feeling, even stronger in the race than qualifying. So uh, we'll see. I mean, I, I tried to set up the car also a bit towards the race, but if it's going to be enough, I don't know. Well, best luck. We can't talk about Verstappen without talking about Sergio Perez. Already so much scrutiny. All you and I have spoken about so far, and indeed probably the entire media fraternity, is how he is under pressure for his seat and who's going to replace him. Crashing out in Q1 certainly didn't help ease that. No, and, and whilst I hate talking about drivers in this way, just constantly being critical... This is a results business, Formula One, and he's not delivering results. And from my my own perspective on this is that if I was running Red Bull, if I was sitting there having to make a decision about what I do with my drivers, 
For me, Perez has got to go. He's just signed a contract extension, but there are lots of rumours about get-out clauses within that. It feels like his performance will definitely trigger one of those get-out clauses. And if you're Red Bull, you've got to get rid of him because it's only having a negative impact on your team's performance in a constructor's battle, which is getting tighter and tighter because the competition particularly McLaren, are getting closer and closer every single race. And whilst Verstappen might be reasonably comfortable in the Drivers' Championship, the Constructors' Championship is definitely not comfortable. And without Perez, they're going to really struggle. Not just struggle in the Constructors' Championship because he's not there scoring points, but he's not there to help Verstappen when it comes to race day. Look at two McLarens. They've got two in that, in that front row that can be strategically helpful to each other. Verstappen doesn't have that. No, and that was alluded to on Verstappen's radio during qualifying. Uh, Perez crashed out in the first part of qualifying, coming in to the left-hander of turn eight, dipped a wheel onto the outside line where it's still a little bit damp and turned in and then the rear just went round on him and into the wall. He went driver okay and out of the car but definitely a bit more damage done to the ego. Let's hear from Checo Perez. Hey, Checo. Well, firstly, glad to see you're OK. Just talk me through that moment and how it all came about. Yeah, it was uh, really, really badly timing, you know. I think at the time it was just training a little bit harder in that part, in that particular part. And I think when I turned in, I clipped a bit the curb and it was on the damp side. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, I ended up losing the car on the, on the way in quite late in the corner and uh, yeah. I basically just um, became a passenger from that point on. I know how much you're, how hard you're trying. We know how much the team are trying. Is it hurt a little bit more that it's just happened again at a frustrating moment? Yeah, of course. You know, it's like it cannot happen again. You know, but uh, at the same time, it it makes me more de determined to to get back, to get back to my form, to get back to with the team, and um, yeah, basically head down and. and and uh, obviously learn from this uh, mistake that has happened uh, one after the other and, and um, take the positives because yesterday I think we, 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 had, we were the fastest car um, in the long run. So hopefully we are able to see that on, on tomorrow's race and uh, make progress, minimize the damage and hopefully score some good points. Best luck tomorrow. Perez then uh, sounding, well, as you would expect him to sound after another dismal qualifying indeed. Q1 eliminations in now four of the last five Grand Prix. He hasn't had a top six finish in the last seven races, mounting pressure on that seat. And for all the talk of who might replace him within that Red Bull fold, well, one of the names was Yuki Tsunoda, and he crashed out in the final part of qualifying as well for RB. And Daniel Ricciardo actually <laughs> had quite a good performance. The two RBs, ninth and 10th as it currently stands. Tsunoda might well have some penalties to boot uh, for any uh, gearbox changes. We don't know that yet, but it, it proves a. a a luxury and a tricky choice for Red Bull at the same time. Uh, yes. So tricky for lots of obvious reasons in that they've got, you know, the halfway through a season, first of all. First of all, I just want to say Perez, I don't think he's lost his talent. I think this is a psychological problem. The pressure's built. He's made continual mistakes. He's trying to overthink it and overdrive it. That causes more mistakes. But in a in elite sport, once you've lost the mental side of your game, that's an enormous chunk of your capacity to deliver that's gone. And I think, and you know, no matter how you look at it, that has gone with Perez. There's no way we're seeing these results without that happening. So that's the first thing. So for me, harsh though it might sound I think he's got to go so then you, you question what do you do next you've got two drivers in the RB team the sister team that's Daniel Ricciardo and Yuki Tsunoda as you said Tsunoda made another mistake today he's been quick in qualifying generally compared to his teammate but in recent races Ricciardo a little bit of a resurgence if, and, and then, of course, they've got uh, Lawson sort of sitting on the sidelines as a reserve driver. So those would be the three that you'd say would be the option if you wanted to replace Perez. But as you just said, it's it's a luxury as well, because we're halfway through the season, more or less. You get this rare opportunity to put another driver in a full race season situation and find out how they not only compare to Max, but deliver in a car that's very different. So you could put a Sonoda or a Ricardo in the main Red Bull car, find out how they can, can drive it. It's a very different type of car, you know, needs different driving styles and characteristics. But you can do that in competition. You don't get that with any other team at the moment. There's no testing, so you can't just go and try somebody on a racetrack on a regular basis. It's a rare opportunity to put someone in a race seat. 
for me, it's a no-brainer because what the alternatives, what leave Perez in and watch your championship disappear gradually down the drain, you might find that you put a Sonoda or even you might find they put Ricardo in there, which might seem like a crazy decision, but they like him and they know what they get from him. And actually, Ricardo could well deliver something very different in a Red Bull than he is in the RB. But whatever, even if it doesn't work, it's not working now. <laughs> so why not try it? Yeah, you're bang on. You know, they're, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place, really, with Perez. I would I would do Sonoda in for the rest of the season. You know, OK, he had the crash, but he's still young. Put Lawson in alongside Ricardo, yep. test him out to the end of the year, and then reevaluate for next season. Well, you're getting two you drivers stand. evaluated there with one move, two for one almost, isn't it? Uh, and, you know, like you say, it's getting that real world evaluation in the, the competitive environment of Formula One that no one gets. So why not do it? Well, that will continue to uh, be discussed, I'm sure, throughout the next uh, races and indeed throughout the summer break. Uh, the other big name to fall in the first part of qualifying was George Russell in the Mercedes. Wrong place, wrong time in a, a drying track. We had that light drizzle to begin with and we had a huge gaggle of cars in that final sector. It was last over the line. Russell, wrong place, wrong time, but also a curious message that he revealed in, in not having enough fuel to put in a final lap. Yeah, I think there were two things. On his on his on the flying lap that he did get, he made some mistakes. He stepped off wide. He lost it, you know, quite early in the lap. So you could say there's driver error there, which he didn't maximise his one opportunity. But then, of course, as you said, the circuit's getting quicker and quicker. He wanted and needed another go, but they'd only fueled him for that one run. So whilst everybody else was just pounding round, and, and of course, there's a, a weight penalty to just fill in the car up with fuel. And normally in qualifying, you'd never do that because of that. But in a circuit that's getting drier and drier or changeable conditions, you forego that weight penalty because the advantage of just being on track when it might get quicker is worth it. And that's what everybody else did. And unfortunately with Russell, I don't know whether the decision was entirely the teams or whether it was a combination through a conversation of driver and team. It doesn't matter. The point is they got it wrong. And when he really needed to be on track, he had to be in the pits refueling. Yeah, and at the track where Russell took his first career pole back in 2022, well, barring uh, any penalties for the time being, uh, he'll start in 17th place for the Grand Prix. So a recovery mission on offer for both him and indeed Sergio Perez for Red Bull. Uh, let's uh, rewind back to uh, the top 10. And I'll tell you who we haven't really focused too much in on this weekend. It's Ferrari. Carlos Sainz and Charles Leclerc have been a, a little bit underwhelming so far this weekend Leclerc sixth signs fourth and just seem to be in a little bit of no man's land at the moment yeah which is slightly odd on one hand it's not because over the last couple of races they have gone missing a little bit or, or perhaps it's that the competition around them have taken a big step forward but if you go back not very far to Monaco they were utterly dominant you know Charles Leclerc winning that Grand Prix in an amazing scenes they often call the Hungaro ring Monaco without the walls, partly because it's very tight and twisted. It's not the same as Monaco by any stretch, but it has some similar characteristics. A lot of slower speed stuff to medium speed stuff. You would have imagined that the Ferrari might have been, this might have been a good circuit for them. And yet they have gone slightly missing. And even in whatever performance they have brought, it's actually been science, I think, that's been the stronger of the two. The guy they're letting go at the end of this year to let Lewis Hamilton in the door has been the guy that's been strongest. I think Carlos Sainz is both putting in a really good case for himself in wherever he goes next, but also kind of handing one to Ferrari saying, look, you should have probably kept me. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, Sainz has out-qualified Leclerc in all three of the last uh, three races we've had. That includes the sprint in Austria. Uh, so it, Sainz is looking kind of more of the solid of the two, but we know they have been running a modified floor this weekend to try and get over some of the bouncing issues that have been reintroduced into that Ferrari since their last upgrade issue. So they are still working their way through some issues Our Ferrari. They do st still sit second in the constructors, but McLaren are right on their tail now. With McLaren getting that one too, that is going to be putting a little bit of fear into the Scuderia, I think. Um, I think it's worth a shout to the two Aston Martins as well, Lance Stroll and Fernando Alonso. Seventh for Alonso, eighth for Stroll, solidly in the top 10. And from the beginning of the weekend, trialling an update this weekend, uh, they both sounded very unhappy with the balance of that car. And it took me by surprise that 
they kind of came came good in qualifying. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, I mean, what they did was they took advantage of this sort of rare occurrence when two of the main top eight, so two of the drivers from the top four teams, who are clearly ahead of everyone else, had those failings, had those crashes. Perez and Russell disappeared, which left a couple of extra spots inside the top 10. And, and it was Aston Martin that stepped up and, and took those. So upgrades, maybe fine-tuning those over the over the course of Friday, getting them to work. The conditions today were very different, much cooler than they were yesterday, where it's very, very hot. We expect the race to be hot as well. So we'll see how that plays out. But really strong result. Both of those guys very close to each other. So Stroll doing a very good job against Alonso as well. And it puts them in a, in a really strong position, in a position which they need to be because the competition around them, I and mean, if we go back earlier in the season, they were in a close battle with Mercedes. Mercedes have won the last two Grand Prix. I don't think anyone's suggesting for a second that we're going to see an Aston Martin start to take those strides forward. But little boosts of confidence like this will just give everybody a little bit of a lift. Yeah, they'll be hoping to try and get back to back double points finishes after last weekend in, in Silverstone. But indeed, Aston Martin, fifth in the constructors, now 153 points behind Mercedes. Really, it's RB, 37 points uh, behind them that they've got to be looking out for. But it was a decent day at the office for Aston to Martin. Let's see if they can convert that into some good points in the race. Um, okay, any other business to report? If we look at it just a little bit further down, and I think one of the biggest losers of them all were the two Alpine drivers, 19th and 20th on the grid, Ocon ahead of Gasly. Yeah, plum last. Um, and the reason that's surprising, because if you go back to the start of the season, that wouldn't have been too much of a shock. But actually in the last three or four races, they've taken giant leaps forward. They've been inside the top 10 consistently, both in qualifying at times, but also in the race scoring points on a regular basis. So to go suddenly from there to the very back is a bit of a shock. I mean, that's the nature of Formula One though right now, isn't it? We've got a series of different types of circuit. This is the, the Hungaro ring, as I said, very different to some of the other tracks we've been to recently, very different to Silverstone, for example, last time out, different demands on the car and on the driver, different downforce levels. And what we've got right now is a Formula One that's so tight all the way through the field, the gaps are so small that little changes to different circuits or different conditions just swing the balance from one team or driver to another at different rounds. And, you know, that's great. That's exactly what Formula One, that's the dream of Formula One, isn't it? That we, we don't, there's not a set order throughout the season and that's how we think it's going to finish. It's all over the place. It's wonderful. It's all over the shop <laughs> and we absolutely lap every single minute of it up. Let's hope the race uh, continues to, to tell more stories. Uh, one other shout out from me, actually, Nico Hulkenberg in 11th, which might might not be too much to write home about for Hulkenberg because we know he's a good qualifier anyway, but he starts at the moment behind Sonoda and Ricardo. Arby and Haas in a really thrilling fight for sixth in the constructors. Just four points between them now. Arby ahead of Haas. And we don't know this yet at the time of recording, but of course with that big shunt for Sonoda, he might well end up taking some sort of penalty if he needs to change any power unit elements and start from the pit lane even. That could promote, obviously, Hulkenberg who can then be in a really good fight with Ricardo. So that is going to be uh, something to watch out for, I think, during the race. Yeah, and what a great leaving present it would be, wouldn't it, from, from Hulkenberg's point of view, leaving the team at the end of the year. How good would it be to leave them with a haul of points? He's really racking them up at the moment, and they mean a lot to a team like Haas, you know, both financially, but also just in terms of the reward and the boost that everybody gets within the team. Then he's making a big difference. Of the two drivers, he's been consistently, I think he's on a real run of good form, Hulkenberg. So if he can find his way into the top 10 in tomorrow's Grand Prix, I think that'll be a great way for him to, to start signing off his season. Yeah, it certainly will. Okay, I think that's just about it from us. Um, how was it? Uh, shadowing Jenny Gow all oh, those years ago. It. Well, it's led on to this moment where we are mm. right now today. So, you know, dream come true. I shadowed Jenny Gow as well. That's how we all get here. Do you? Yeah, well, yeah. yeah we learn from the learn from the very best. Absolutely. Uh, look, that brings an end to our qualifying podcast. But of course, the main one will come tomorrow post Grand Prix. And that is what we're all gearing up for. Lando Norris on pole gunning for a victory that perhaps he feels has escaped him of late. Piastri trying to record his first F1 win will start alongside. And Verstappen in third, looking to try and pip them both and return Red Bull to the top step of the rostrum. So many stories to look out for up and down the grid. I hope you can join us for it. My thanks to Mark Priestley. We will be on air for the race on Sunday, wherever you listen to us from 1.45 UK time ahead of Lights Out from 2 o'clock. Uh, we'll see you then for what is sure to be an absolute thriller. This has been an IMG production for BBC Radio 5 Live.